Well, this is an oral history with uh, Peter Hart for the Computer History Museum, and I am David Brock interviewing. Uh, so, Peter, as I said, to uh, begin at the beginning, could you tell us a bit about when and where you were born? I was born in 1941 in Brooklyn, New York. And could you tell us a little bit about your family of origin? Yeah, my, <clears throat> my, um, my father was a lawyer. My, my mother was a housekeep, uh, housewife or homekeeper until uh, my sister and I were teenagers, in which, at which time she became the administrative head of a university department. Which university was that? Uh, Brooklyn College. Okay. And she was the administrative head of the chemistry department for quite a few years. I'm trying to think if I know who was in the chemistry department. <laughs> then. Um, and did your, your father was part of a firm in Brooklyn or worked on his own? No, he, uh, he eventually be worked in the New York State court system and he was uh, a legal researcher for the presiding justice of the appellate division. Okay, so was supporting uh, sort of like a judicial clerk, that sort of uh, a No, role, I wouldn't say or? clerk. He actually wrote the opinions okay. that were then signed off on by the judge he worked for. Right. So it was sort of like people who clerk for a Supreme Court justice, that sort of a role, like very actively involved. In Except he was a mature cases. professional. Clerking right. is usually a, you know, academic follow-on, whereas he was a mature professional. Right. And then it sounds like your, your family um, lived in Brooklyn for, um, yes. for your entire youth. Yes. Um, what was, uh, what section of Brooklyn did you grow up in? Did, or which sections of Brooklyn did you grow <clears> up in? Until I was about 13, I grew up in Crown Heights, a few blocks from Ebbets Field, uh, so close that in the summertime, <clears throat> if the windows were open and Duke Snyder hit a home run, you could hear the crowd. And if you turned on the radio and waited the 30 seconds or so for the tubes to warm up, you would hear that he had hit it over the right field wall or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> when I was about 13, we moved to Flatbush, uh, not that far away, but a different neighborhood, and we were just a couple of blocks from Brooklyn College, which made it easy for my mother. And Brooklyn College is adjacent to Midwood High School, which is a good neighborhood high school in Brooklyn, and that's where I went to high school. And could, well, how would you characterize your, um, the neighborhoods in which you grew up? So we're talking about your neighborhoods. Right? So Crown Heights at the time was a very heavily Jewish neighborhood. I'll guess that my elementary school was 75% Jewish or more. And uh, Flatbush that we moved to was also a very Jewish neighborhood, at least at that time. And so it was uh, kind of a homogeneous, comfortable place to live. Crown Heights was apartment houses. We lived in an apartment house. And um, Flatbush was beautiful, leafy green, um, single family or two family homes. And so it was really a very lovely residential neighborhood in the, in the center of Brooklyn. And did you attend the, you, you talked a little bit about your, your high school. Did you attend the, the public schools um, before yeah. that? Yes, but with an asterisk. Um, <clears throat> when, um, when I was around the fifth grade or so, my parents were very concerned that I was totally losing interest in school because it was so boring. Mm. And they put me through some special, uh, I, I was flunking reading. And the reason I was flunking reading is because I never had the place. I was always 200 pages ahead in the reader because it was so boring. And the only thing the teacher ever cared about is did you have the place when you were called upon? We we're reading this page, this sentence, and so they had me tested and they discovered in the fifth grade or so I was reading at a 12th year, ninth month level, but maybe higher because that's as high as it went. And so they said, we have to do something. And so they found a public school, PS 208. My wife from California thinks it's hilarious <clears throat> that in New York City, public schools have numbers and not names. So I went from PS 161, which was a half a block away to PS 208, which was two bus rides away, or a bus ride and a train ride away. <clears throat> but this public school had a very special track that was, today you would consider it a gifted and talented track or by some name. And at that point, life got much better. There was science, there was a foreign language, there were all sorts of things in the fifth or sixth grade, I can't remember. 
that really re-engaged me with the primary school education. Were you traveling there with other students from nope. your, just on your own? Nope. These uh, kids came from all over the borough, and you got a monthly pass uh, for the, trans for the uh, transportation <clears throat> needs, and you made your way there however you could. So as I said, I had a choice of two buses or a bus and a train each way. <laughs> Which did you prefer? Uh, depending on the weather. <laughs> um, with that... Uh, with that capacity and appetite for reading, was the library a big part of your life? Yeah, and particularly in the summer, we had a small summer place in northern New Jersey in what's now a metropolitan area, but, but then in those days was, I guess the word was bucolic. Um, and I would take out as many books as the local library would allow, and I'd finish them in a heartbeat, and the next Monday night when the little library was open again, I'd swap it out and do it, do it over, over again. What sorts of things were you reading? I was pretty omniscient. Um, I read uh, the earlier um, fiction about uh, science kids and uh, mystery kids. I read nonfiction. I read just everything in the library. And have, how ha has that um, that appetite for reading continued throughout of course. your life? Sure. Um, in many of the well, was science fiction at all? Did that become a feature sure. of your reading? Could you talk a little bit about that? Do you think that was significant for no. developing your interests? No, I don't. It was just one of many, many things that I that I was in, that I read. You know. Okay. Um, for many people, their their household will have um, a pronounced theme or themes. Um, for some households, it's education art, politics, religion, business, uh, reading, technical pursuits. Um, if you had to name some of those themes for your household, which would you choose? Um, family orientation. I was really fortunate. My sister and I grew up in a very close and very lovely or loving family. Uh, we had wonderful relationship with our parents until they passed away in late old age. Uh, my sister and I still have a very close relationship. She just turned 80. Um, we were just so fortunate compared to so many other families that I've later seen. We just thought it was normal. Um, my father was quite a private person. He wasn't a glad hander or a get out and about sort of thing. He preferred small group gatherings, family gatherings to big parties. Um, he was, I have to say, a brilliant individual who wanted to be an engineer, but when he was growing up, uh, there was a very strong anti-Semitic streak in the engineering profession. I don't know if you've run across this before in your interviews, but uh, places like, and this is, I'm just told, I couldn't, yeah. you're the historian, so you'd have to verify this, but at least the story that I grew up with was that places like Bell Labs were famously anti-Semitic. I don't know if that's true, but that was the perception. And Depends on the time period, perhaps. Well, this would have been like 1930 or something like that, very early. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not vouching for the accuracy, and I don't want to cast aspersions. I'll just say that from the point of view of my father, in his formative periods, he loved engineering, but it was considered to be a non-option mm -hmm. for that reason. Again, whether it was well-founded or not, but that was so the perception. It was his experience. Um, and so he became a lawyer, which I don't think he ever really liked. Um, my mother um, was a terrific read of people. She had tremendous street smarts and a very good read of people and just very charming and very engaging. And I have to say in her younger years, quite strikingly good looking and her son, <coughs> her son did not inherit that. Um, but. Um, but the one other thing I want to mention about my upbringing, because I think it really affected my life and it's something I basically had to overcome, was that <clears throat> like many people of their generation, they came of age during the Great Depression, looking for their first jobs in the very depths of the early 1930s. And like so many of that generation, it really marked them for life. Mm. They were very conservative, in terms of risk-taking, uh, very risk-averse, very protective of my sister and me because who knows what might happen to you out in the world. 
Um, and, and that's really what I grew up with. And so when I started my professional career, I didn't have a specific personal objective to overcome that. I'm not sure I even recognized that. Mm. But with the benefit of 50 years or more of hindsight, I can see that um, the whole arc of my adult life has been sort of overcoming that and overcoming shyness. Uh, and people who meet me now really find it hard to believe uh, because I meet people very easily. I'll give you one non-technical um, sidelight on that. <clears throat> I bike a lot. I bike thousands of miles a year and have done that for 30 years. And I bike with a bunch of buddies who have an informal biking group and I'm the um, administrator of the Google group, you know, the, the mail group. Right. Almost everybody in that group is there because I met them on the road and started chatting. Uh, so I just mentioned that to say, well, I'm not shy anymore. But it really has been a kind of an odyssey from, from this uh, early beginning. Was that something that you think that in your youth, let's say through high school, other people would have described you as shy? Not painfully, but they would not have uh, not painfully shy, right. but they would not have described me, I think, of being particularly outgoing and somebody who meets people easily and starts conversations easily with almost anybody at any level in any walk of life, which, which honestly is just second nature to me now that I do because I like to. Was there, uh, just continuing on, continuing on that line, was there was there some sort of uh, moment or period in your life where you really uh, made a decision to no. kind of? No, no, not at all. There was nothing gradual... transformative. It was gradual. Yeah. yeah, yeah, interesting. And I think probably it was partly due to my wife, who I can talk at great length about because she's the love of my life. But, well, um, please, I uh, when we. Um, get to the point in the chronology when you meet her. Okay. Let's please do that. Okay. Um, was, was religion part of your household? Not much. Um, and I thought it was bizarre until I was in my mid-twenties and learned more about that. Um, our family was very strongly Jewish in a cultural sense and not the least bit Jewish in a religious sense. And I thought that was when I was a teenager, for example, like, we are really strange. Until I learned a little more, and I learned that there was an Eastern European tradition of what's called Yiddishkeit, which means the state of being Jewish, which is a cultural and not a religious comment, and it turns out there were quite a few people <laughs> like our family, um, and not, you know, not that strange at all, but, um, right. but we, we did have a strong Jewish identity, and I still do. Um, with your your father's kind of uh, frustrated interest in a technical career, um, was was he a part of your developing interest in technical things as a youth? You know, it's a good question, and I think in hindsight, probably yes. Uh, <clears throat> what I'll say is that in high school. Um, I don't know how to say this super politely and without coming across as being a little self-important, but um, I was basically good in every subject. Mm -hmm. um, in New York City high schools, you got number grades and not letter grades, which again, my wife found hilarious because she got A's and A minuses and B pluses, and we got 75% and 82%. And I basically got 98 or 99 percent plus in every single subject and, you know, won the prize in Spanish or won the prize in whatever. Um, so it wasn't obvious that I had a singular capability. Mm. And so it's like, well, what do you want to do? And probably it was my father's encouragement that I went towards a technical side. I could just, I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer and I'm very glad to this day that I never was. But, um, but uh, you know, I think I could have pursued any sort of career and this is what I chose. Was there a time during high school when that became your your movement in that direction towards science, technology, mathematics became more Well pronounced? it started a bit earlier when I was in the seventh or eighth grade I won the Westinghouse Science Prize oh. 
And with the money, I bought the largest chemistry set that was made. And we built a kind of work lab bench sort of thing in our basement. And other than nearly setting the house on fire twice, because my favorite section of the gigantic, many hundred page manual of chemistry experiments that this came with was a special section called pyrotechnics. Uh -huh. And it turns out that pyrotechnics was not a good thing to do in a basement with a six foot ceiling. And so, so other than a few horrifying experiments, um, it was great. I did glass blowing and gas bending, uh, gl a glass bending with Bunsen burners and blow tubes. I could keep a steady stream of air because you learn to inflate your cheeks and right. keep it going and inhale and so on and so forth. So yeah, I became quite adept. Well, um, with uh, bangs, flashes, and stinks, you are well on your way to becoming a chemist. And here's a cautionary tale. When I went to, this is now leaping ahead, uh, my undergraduate school was Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Right. And at RPI, there was a mandatory first year chemistry class. And it was such a horrible experience taught by such a horrible professor that in one semester, it took this young guy's burning interest in chemistry and decided I am never gonna to touch that for the rest of my life. So fortunately, I've had some wonderful academic mentoring, <laughs> but that was an extreme example of a negative one. Uh, but yeah, even in the seventh or eighth grade, I was very interested in that stuff. And of course, it really came to the fore when you had to pick a school or college when right. you were in your, say, junior or senior year, and that's when the the die was cast and the direction was set. Could you talk about your experience with that Westinghouse prize and you know what your project was and, and how, um, if that was a big deal for you, which I imagine it was a it very should big have deal. been. <laughs> it was a very big deal, partly yeah. because there was you know a certain you know recognition, sure. and partly because we had I would say fairly modest economic means. I mentioned my father was a civil servant. Right. And we always had enough to eat. We were never poor, but there wasn't a ton of money. Um, and uh, this prize was what allowed me to buy this giant chemistry set. Um, I still remember vividly what our, uh, what our exhibit was. And um, what I did was an exhibit on underground structures, geological structures that um, harbored hydrocarbons. And so it was all about petroleum, crude oil, and in particular, anticlines and synclines and where these deposits or um, oil fields were and what kind of geology they were based on and how the oil moved through the permeable or impermeable strata and that sort of thing. It was, it was pretty, pretty cool. And the, um, the funny thing is fast forward many decades and I wound up starting the world's first artificial intelligence center in a commercial corporation. I say that as far as I know it was, but we'll leave it to the historians to confirm that. Uh, and I did it for a company called Schlumberger, which is the world's largest oil field services company. So <laughs> I apparently got an early start in the seventh or eighth grade on that. And not an unrelated topic from your expert system prospector. Very related, very related. And that, in fact, I think Prospector is what caught the eye of uh, Michel um, um, Jean Rabou, Jean Rabou, who was the chairman and CEO of Schlumberger at the time. And to call him Louis XIV would not to be saying enough. You would not be giving him enough credit. I mean, he dominated one of the world's most profitable companies, mm. Schlumberger. And uh, in 79 or 80 or 81, he said artificial intelligence is the new oil. And uh, through his executive vice president, Tom Roberts, recruited me to start this lab. I hope to dig into that we'll come, in we'll detail. We'll get to that later. Um, was, your, what, was it a Gilbert chemistry set that you bought? No, or? it was chem, Chemcraft. Chemcraft. It was the, there were two, Gil, you have a tremendous memory. They were two more or less side-by-side -side competitors. Chemcraft came from, I think, someplace in Maryland, uh, and they had a bunch of sets, and this was the giant one, and it happened to be almost exactly 
the price, well, the price was almost exactly what my prize was. So. That's fantastic. Uh, could you describe, I mean, you were kind of zipping through all your classes in high school, but um, could you describe, you know, the con what your high school was like? Was there a... It was a very good neighborhood high school. Before we went there, my parents um, took me around and we looked into places like Brooklyn Tech and Stuyvesant, yeah. which are the obvious ones, although quite a long way from where we lived, particularly Stuyvesant. Uh, in downtown Manhattan, and we talked to college admissions officers, and they said, you know, if it's a good neighborhood high school, that's fine. Um, it was an enormous high school. There were about 4,000 kids in it, about 1,000 per, per year. Um, it was probably 75% Jewish or more, and I think at least 90% of us went on to college. It was a college prep high school. <clears throat> I was um, uh, I was a handball player. Uh, most people listening or watching or reading about this interview will not know there's something called handball, which is a big East Coast sport. And I was on the um, I was um, on the handball team in, for two years. And I also was in the bio lab and the physics lab and the chem lab as a in the science honor society and stuff as a volunteer. But there was one big downside. And the big downside of that high school is that it was so overcrowded that we were in multiple sessions. Starting, the earliest one started about 7 or 7.30 in the morning, the latest yes. one went in something to like 6 p.m. Mm. And as you progress through, you're supposed to go through different sessions, but because they made some changes while I was going through, for two years I was in the afternoon session, which means I went to school at about noon. So what do you do in the morning? You know, play with other, you know, meet other people, you're just hanging around doing homework in the morning, so you really had no life mm -hmm. in the high school. <clears throat> and then in the, uh, in the uh, last two years, I had this 7 or 7.30 in the morning thing and finished at 12 or 1, so it really wasn't conducive to a social life yeah. because of that. So that was the only unfortunate thing, and you know, they did the best they could with the enrollment they had, so, you know, I'm still a supporter. <laughs> And could you talk about, um, well, uh, as your time in high school was coming to a close, obviously you was, and, and all of your peers are thinking about college. Um, chemistry's on the map for you. Um, you know, what was your, your um, university selection process like? It was pretty straightforward. It was MIT or RPI. Mm -hmm. And I got into both of them. But uh, I had a New York State scholarship to RPI because it's in Troy, New York. Right. And my family financially was in what nowadays would be called the donut hole, mm -hmm. namely too much income to qualify for a scholarship at MIT and too little income to have enough to pay. Right. And so uh, I said, well, that's easy. I'm going to RPI because there was a... New York State scholarship that was not enormous, but it was not need-based, at least at some minimal level. Right. And so I went to RPI. And was there, was it organic chemistry that was their thing at RPI? Or was oh, sure. there a particular draw of, no. to the chemistry there? No. Just a good reputation? No, it just, it was just a good school and probably wasn't quite at the same level as MIT, but it was considered to be a fine technical right. university or polytechnic or whatever they call it now. Um, but as I said, my interest in chemistry was turned off within the first three months. I never looked at it again. Well, uh, and how, well, then how did, you know, being kind of uh, repelled from chemistry? How did I pick electrical engineering? Yeah. Well, that was sort of a really good question. So I mentioned that, that I really had pretty broad interest, and I still do. And what I liked about electrical engineering was that it was so broad that A, it covered lots of things, and B, I could foresee that I could specialize out of practically all of it if I got interested in one particular little subspecialty of electrical engineering. In fact, that's what eventually happened. Um, what was en electrical engineering like at RPI in those years? You, were you started there in 58. Eight. Yeah. So um, I have to say, in all honesty, it was a little bit behind the times. 
uh, they hadn't quite gotten their, the, the teaching faculty, and RPI at least then was primarily an undergraduate teaching school with a fairly small graduate school. It was a graduate PhD granting institution, but it wasn't very big. It's since gotten, I think, very different. Right. Uh, but at that time, it was primarily undergraduate, and they hadn't really quite kept the curriculum refreshed. For example, um, in a year and a half of electronics, there was only a very small amount of time devoted to transistors. Mm. And that would have been in 61 or 62, and transistors were invented in 48, and that right. should have been enough time to get a little more solid state stuff in there. So they were a little behind. They were a little behind in offering things like, or even mandating things, like uh, linear algebra and probability theory in the undergraduate curriculum, and that was something I paid for dearly at Stanford when I found I was far behind my peers. My first year at Stanford, I, I was struggling because I didn't have these prereqs that were assumed. So RPI was good in many ways, but it, it fell a little bit short, I'd have to say, in those respects. I, again, because of money, I, for two years, the uh, last two years there, I worked part-time in the electronic shop which was fun because it was in the attic of the double E building that nobody else could go to. And you got there by an Otis elevator that was so old, like from the 1880s or 90s, that Otis denied ever having built it, even though it said in a big brass plate, Otis on it. <laughs> and um, I used to do, there, some things were hilarious. So for example, one semester working there in the afternoons, I was building lab setups six or eight or ten lab setups for the electronics lab three, which was part of electronics, was mandatory. And the next semester, I was in electronics three using those setups, and I actually did rather well. <laughs> and uh, w w w it was a, um, someone in charge of that what kind of work was it up in that electronic shop? Well, it was, it was very varied. So, for example, uh, we had a lot of scrounged second-hand military equipment that we would uh, scavenge for parts, mm. uh, for components, electrical components. Right. So RPI didn't have a big endowment and still doesn't. And the, uh, so we had all sorts of hand-me-downs hand and you know, cast-offs that companies or the military would donate. And I could take apart a typical commercial uh, item and get the tubes out or components or whatever. But the mil spec stuff, the military stuff, you practically needed a blowtorch to get those things apart. I mean, they were all like so ruggedized right. <laughs> that you spent all your time on the mechanical aspects, like, how do I get inside this thing? <laughs> uh, but, you know, eventually you take it apart and you grab stuff. So there was everything from that to, as I mentioned, building uh, electronics labs student setups to troubleshooting, you know, oscillators that professors were using for demos. It was pretty much everything. Did computers enter into the picture in these years? Barely. Can you talk about that? Barely. It was, again, I think maybe, I think maybe at that time RPI was just a little bit slow mm -hmm. in coming up to speed, so <clears throat> I only had one real computer exposure and that was programming my first machine, which was an IBM 650. Mm -hmm. Would have been around maybe 61 or two I did that, which was not a brand new machine by any means. Right. Um, but uh, if I were to describe the specs even now, it'd be astonishing. Main memory, so-called random access memory, was a magnetic drum with 2,000 storage locations. Um, the programming language was um, Pure machine language, pure octal, no symbolic assembler. So you didn't say ADD for add, you said like 24 or something like that, and that was an add instruction. The, uh, I remember it was a double address machine, and the principal optimization method, oh, yeah, you stored variables using absolute memory locations. And the principal optimization method was to sprinkle the arguments around the periphery of the drum to minimize drum latency so you didn't have to wait a whole revolution nice. of this drum. You know, I, I hope it comes up next. <laughs> um, and, and of course, it was a nightmare to de debug even a simple program, but every instruction was 
a two-digit opcode, a four-digit location, and a four-digit location, and you know, ten octal digits, and that was, that, you know, go read that code. You know? <laughs> oh, I yeah. Um, but what was your reaction to that? It was hard. Yeah. It was hard, and you know, it made me much more appreciative of high and higher and higher level languages as the years rolled by because, um, you know, the old joke, <clears throat> this may sound sexist nowadays, is, you know, real men use an assembly language. Yeah. Well, real men don't actually accomplish that much. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, so it was extremely painstaking programming. And it, it, I'm not getting the sense that it was a kind of an aha moment for you. I didn't love it. You. You didn't I didn't love it. love it. I mean, I certainly saw the power. I certainly recognized what it meant to be a stored program. I certainly recognized what it meant to be able to treat programs code like data right. interchangeably. I certainly got the von Neumann machine concept. But as an intellectual activity, it was so painful that it didn't immediately draw me into it and say, boy, I just love doing this. Almost nobody did it that, you know, at that level. It was, it's really hard, painstaking stuff to do even very simple things. How did your interest develop during those undergraduate years? Certainly into electronics and electrical engineering. Was there something that you found yourself drawn to? Nope. Nope. I, I, uh, I graduated. I, you know, I graduated high in the class and uh, uh, I looked on to the next <laughs> stage of my education. And making that bridge to Stanford, was that related to any uh, mentors that you had at um, RPI? I had one mentor at RPI who said, get a PhD, no matter what you do. I guess he thought maybe I was, you know, I had maybe a little more than a pulse going for me. Yep. Uh, and um, he said, whatever you do, get a PhD, don't stop. Uh, and when I looked at the, around at various schools, um, Stanford attracted me for two very powerful reasons. Mm -hmm. The first was, I was able to get a full fellowship from Hughes for at least the first year of graduate school. And as I mentioned, money was always, money at that scale, at the tuition scale, was always a consideration. And it was clear that I would get a fellowship only if I went to a California school. It wasn't an official requirement, but it was very clear. The second thing I really liked about Stanford is that when I compared it to Caltech, I have no idea if this is still true, Caltech had a very rigid um, course and curriculum requirement for a degree. Almost everything was um, mandatory and almost no electives. And Stanford, at the graduate level, was just the opposite. You could do almost anything through electives as long as you put together sequences. They didn't want you to take you know, the first course in every single subject. Right. So you did have to put together sequences that made sense, but it could be anything. There was, I think, maybe literally no required classes. So between that freedom, you know, God, look what I can pick and choose, and saying, at least my first year is paid for, it was a no-brainer. How did that, that Hughes funding come about? How did that It was pretty rigorous. Materialize. They, they, um, they I, I saw that you could apply, so I applied. Um, they um, actually had me interview physically. I went from Troy, New York, down to a hotel room in Manhattan and met some young but adult mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, professional that they sent there. And we had a very nice conversation. And um, a little while later, I got a phone call in my apartment that I shared with my some fraternity brothers in Troy saying we're very happy to say that we've offered, we, we can offer you a work study or co-op fellowship. And I was aware that Hughes offered two flavors. One was a co-op where he basically worked in virtually full time and took a couple of courses. And the other was a full fellowship where you were on campus full time. Okay. So I said, I guess this may have foreshadowed a latent talent. But I said to the gentleman on the phone, I said, well, I, I really don't want to appear to be negotiating with you. I said as I began to negotiate. But you know, I've already received exactly the same offer from Bell Labs. 
which has a work co-op program, and I had indeed received it. It was not a bluff. And you went to you know, Princeton or wherever the school was, and I said, honestly, I, I really cannot say if I would accept the Hughes Fellowship since, you know, Bell Labs is also a pretty attractive place. And immediately, it's amazing how I remember this so many mm. years later, never forgotten, he immediately said, well, in that case, I'm authorized to offer you a full fellowship. I said, in that case, I'm delighted to accept. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was a done deal. And, uh, you know, next thing I knew, I was driving across country to uh, California. And what did you, um, when you came to the, did you visit Stanford before you made the decision yes, to Yes, my sister and brother-in-law had moved out to Southern California two or three years earlier, and we drove up and I saw Stanford, and I, well, you know, what can you say? Did you meet with any of the nope. faculty? Nope. Okay. Just drove around and said, boy, this is nice. Well, uh, so you, when you arrived, you entered into the electrical engineering department? Yeah, there was a little bit of a, pre a precursor. Hughes was really good. They gave me a summer job. Uh, and even a Christmas job, but they gave me a summer job. And I worked in the operations research uh, activity there, and I learned a lot about search procedures and uh, a little bit about linear programming before, you know, I had gotten to an academic. You know, I learned some stuff in the summer. Was that their operation in Malibu or? or? No, it was uh, in Culver City, uh -huh. uh, right alongside a big airstrip, which is no, long, no longer there, just below the bluff that Loyola sits on top of. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, so it was you know it was a great experience. Spent the summer, trucked up to Stanford, and um, launched into this um, master's program. And it was the shock of my life. It was the hardest year of my life, in a professional or intellectual or academic sense, by far. For what reason? <clears throat> well, several. So in the first place, at RPI, as I mentioned, I was pretty much at the top of everything class and, you know, president of Ada Kappa Nu and stuff like that. And there were lots of people you could count on to fill out the bottom half of the class. Mm -hmm. At Stanford, everybody was, you know, smarter than me. Uh, there was nobody to fill out the bottom mm -hmm. <laughs> of the distribution. The second thing, as I mentioned, was that I really was lacking some prerequisites, primarily, most especially linear algebra and probability theory. Mm -hmm. And so I was taking those classes, basically upper division classes or first year uh, graduate classes in, uh, in math, in the math department and in the stat department, at the same time that I was taking the electrical engineering graduate classes that depended on that. Right. So like, you know, I don't think I've gotten to this yet. <laughs> and everybody else around me already knew that stuff. It was, wasn't a problem. So it, I mean, I never worked harder than I did that year. Even starting companies, I never worked harder than that year. And the hard work paid off? You were well, successful? I got A's. Yeah, yeah, I got A's. Um, and the other thing that happened, bringing the previous story up to date on the timeline, is that I met my wife um, two or three months after I arrived at Stanford at a party, I was given her platonic date a ride, and um, uh, you know, I met her and we sat in the corner of this apartment where the party was in Palo Alto and we must have talked for two or three hours and I went home and said, I'm going to marry her. And, and, uh, and about a month or so later, maybe it was two months, uh, we decided, yeah, we would. Wow, that quickly. And, uh, and it took a while longer uh, to actually get married, but uh, before she graduated, she was an undergraduate, while she was still an undergraduate, we were married. She was an undergraduate at Stanford? In the history department, yeah. Hmm. And uh, was, she fr is, was she, is she a native Californian? Or she is she? a native Californian, and her mother was a native Californian, and her father was almost a native Californian. He moved to the state when he was an infant, I think. Yeah. And um, seems to have worked out so far. <laughs> I'm glad to hear. Um, so as that as that brutal year comes to a close, yeah. I mean, what you, you 
had you joined for specifically a master's program, or yeah. you, were you okay? And that then was a master's program, and and deciding to stay on and continue um, at Stanford. You know, could you talk well, about when that? I, when I when after I met Diane, and I knew that this was my fate and my destiny. Right. Um, I wasn't going to move any place in the country without her. And uh, <clears throat> so what happened was that um, the fellowship was only for one year full time and nine months later I had a master's degree. Um, three different professors offered me uh, research assistantships to continue on to a PhD in the EE department. And one by one, all three of them called me over the summer to say their funding had fallen through and they couldn't offer me the assistantship. Mm. So that was my introduction to contract research funding. Mm. And so <clears throat> what to do? So I got a job at Philco Ford, which is, was on Fabian Way where the, um, where the um, Jewish Community Center is now, the Oshman right. Center is now on the, on sort of where Charleston and San Antonio cross. Sure. And uh, they had the great advantage of offering an honors co-op program, which is the only way you could take Stanford classes. So I would take a class or two a quarter, and I started studying for the PhD qualifying exams, which is, you probably know, was the hurdle in the W department. Okay. If you pass the quals, you'll probably nine out times out of 10, you will eventually finish a dissertation and, and get a PhD. But Stanford EE department then, and maybe now, had an actual policy of flunking half of the students who took it. Oh. And once again, this is Stanford, there's nobody to fill out the bottom half, you know? Right. Everybody is brilliant, motivated, prepared, tough competition. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> so I studied and I took the, Took, took the quals, and I'll tell you a story about that. Um, and um, the quals, at least then, were orals. I think they still might be. And it was a half an hour with each of four professors in four distant, different EE disciplines. And the typical deal was they'd ask you a question, and if they saw you knew the answer, they'd ask you a harder one. <laughs> So there were people all over the map in uh, electromagnetic field theory and semiconductors and systems and so forth. So <clears throat> one of my professors who was examining me was someone I had for a class. Um, shall I name the name? Please do. Tom Kylath, who's had a brilliant career. I guess he may be emeritus now, but a brilliant, brilliant career. At that time, he was an assistant professor. And so he asked me a couple of questions, and OK, fine. Then he started started asking me questions about estimating power spectral densities. And there's well-known theoretical issues, at least 50 years ago they were, <laughs> maybe they're solved now, about how to do that. And, and I struggled and struggled and struggled, and I just could not get, what's the right way to do this? Mm. I knew what you're taught, and I knew the theoretical inconsistencies of what you're taught because it's explained, but you know, what's the fix? I couldn't get there. So <clears throat> I was devastated, you know, I flunked. And uh, by, after that, <clears throat> it's the morning, I'm having lunch with another fellow graduate student, happened to be a Tom Kylath student, mm -hmm. graduate student. And he says, so hey, Peter, how did the quals go? And I was depressed, I was ready to slip my wrists. I said, well, I think I did pretty well with three of them, but, you know, I had Tom was one of my, oh, was Tom one of your examiners? There must be 50 faculty or something. Yeah, Tom was one of my examiners. He said, what did, did he ask? Well, I, he asked me some simple stuff, and then he asked me this question about power spectral density, and I said, Chuck, I absolutely couldn't get any traction on that. So this good graduate student friend of mine who tips back and laughs his head off when I was going to shoot him, you know, like, what's so yeah, funny? Right. And so he says to me, my friend says to me, he says, can I use strong language here? Please do. He says to me, that son of a bitch. He said, that's his current research topic. He has no idea what the answer is either. <laughs> so I thought, <laughs> yeah, maybe a reprieve. So that night, um, we're sitting around waiting for phone calls. One of my housemates also took the exams. 
and his call comes in first, and he's glum, and he sits down, and he shakes his head. He flunked. He did not pass. He was in the bottom half. <clears throat> half an hour later, I get my advisor calls, and he tells me some news, and I just nod, and I hang up, and they said, did you pass? And I, because my friend, you know, right, just, is right there. so I just said, yes. But, but my advisor said, you know, in the forced ranking, you came out three out of 150. Wow. <laughs> that I didn't want to say. Yeah, right. Out of seemliness. And within a week, three different professors called me and said, we have a research assistant. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your advisor at that time? Well, my advisor was just a, what they call a program advisor, okay. not an academic. So it was, uh, he, he was an assistant professor who I think never got tenure and never saw again. Okay. So he's there for, you know, helping with the program. I see, I see. Because uh, you don't have a thesis topic yet. Right. Um, and, um, and so I had wonderful choices with wonderful but very different specialists. Joe Goodman, who was a world-class laser person, Mm. Uh, or uh, I forget. Anyway, but I, I opted to go with a systems lab that uh, was doing things in pattern recognition and learning machines and things like that. And I thought this was really cool. And whose lab was that? It was um, it was in something called the Applied Electronics Lab, hmm. which was the little building next to the to the uh, Skilling Building. I think it was called. These are all long since scraped. Um, and it was really not as academic as a pure um, tenured faculty lab would be. It was more like, a con of, course, of course, everything was contract research and grants, but, um, but there wasn't any actual tenured professor responsible for that. But that's where the money was. That's where the assistantship was. I mean, I had a boss, Don Grace, his name was, great guy, but he wasn't faculty. Uh, and so there's tremendous freedom to poke around, and I can tell you maybe the next story, the story is about my uh, advisor and my thesis maybe. I would love to hear that. Before we move into that, could yeah. I ask you a quick question sure. about Philco Ford? Yeah. Was that the former general microelectronics operation? I think GME had been bought by Philco. And I, don't, then I don't know. It doesn't soon, sound, it doesn't ring a bell. Was it an integrated bell. circuit operation? No, it was oh. not. It was not. It was uh, more systems level stuff. And I think Ford bought it about, I was there for only months almost. Okay. But I think Ford bought it about the time, it might have been just Philco at the time that I was there. That would be the right timing. Yeah. So what, what, what kind of activity was going on there? Well, they gave me a job as a trainee where I spent a month or two in each of several different departments. So one of the first departments I spent time was with Jim Spilker's department. Uh, Jim Spilker went on to be uh, quite famous and a uh, company founder uh, in um, basically signal processing and um, um, pseudo-random sequences for uh, obscuring telecommunication mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And then I had some others and uh, spent not much time in each, learned a little bit from each, and then I was back at Stanford when this <sighs> things opened up. <laughs> well, t well, well, thank you, Philco. Yeah. <laughs> well, please, uh, let's, let's move on to that, that laboratory that you joined. So that was a really nice group of people uh, <clears throat> outside of the double E department building in this small adjunct that had a relative handful of people. <clears throat> and um, I needed a topic and I needed an advisor. So <clears throat> somebody said, there's this guy named Tom Cover, who was a recent Stanford PhD. Stanford, as you know, doesn't eat their own young. Mm -hmm. So he had gone to MIT for a year or two to get, I guess, sanitized or detoxed or something after which Stanford brought him back. Okay. And the name Tom Cover uh, became a legend. Uh, he sadly passed away not too many years ago, but Tom was maybe one of the two or three most brilliant people I've ever had a conversation with. 
um, and just a fabulous individual in every respect, uh, almost otherworldly intellectual powers in certain respects. And so I went over to see him. He had just come back on campus. He didn't have a single student as far as I know. And that first conversation I still remember was like a two-hour conversation. And at the end of the two hours, I knew two things. First, this was maybe the smartest person I've ever had a two-hour conversation with. And second, I really, really, really want him to be my advisor. Mm. And that's the way it turned out. Uh, and so um, just to give you a little bit about Tom, I mean, books should be written about him. And Marty Hellman, who example, uh, for example, was one of his early students. I was Tom's student number one. Okay. Marty, who's still a good friend, was maybe three or something like that. I see. Uh, and he's had, uh, Tom had many very distinguished students, but I was the first one. <clears throat> and Tom had the ability to, for example, visualize things in high dimensional vector spaces. And the geometry of high dimensional vector spaces is so unintuitive that most mortals can't do that. Yeah. He, he would see it, or he would see the combinatorics of things. I mean, he was just, his mathematical insights were like preternatural. Mm. E even today, it's just like, I'm in awe. Uh, <clears throat> so we started working on this and that kind of thing, sequential decision theory, non-parametric decision theory. Um, although the W department, Tom was a fabulous mathematician and statistician, and I think he probably had a dual appointment at some point in statistics. But at that point, by the way, he was an acting assistant professor, and as such could not legally sign off on a dissertation. But I guess I was a pretty good judge of character even at that tender age, and I thought, you know, by the time I need a signature, I bet it'll be a full assistant professor. <laughs> <laughs> and he was. Uh, but at that time, I was taking a chance. So we started on this um, world's simplest pattern classification method called the nearest neighbor rule. Right. Have you heard of that? Well, I just so became it acquainted bit? with it and prepared. Well, yes, please. I'll explain it. So you convert any pattern, visual or any kind of pattern, into a sequence of numbers that forms a vector. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're uh, classifying humans into male or female based on height and weight, you would have height and weight for each individual. And of course, there'd be a two-dimensional space. And of course, there'd be a big overlap of distribution. That's a very unreliable way to tell males from females. But there is some separation. Mm -hmm. So pattern classification is about, <coughs> mathematical pattern pa classification is about <coughs> converting patterns to vectors, points in a vector space, and then using some method to distinguish a new pattern as being a male or a female, or one of 97 different patterns, or whatever. Right. Different classes, I should say. Okay. So that's what pattern classification is, is about. And there's many, many, meth many, many ways of doing it with all sorts of different assumptions and mechanisms. It's a, a textbook like that of methods. Probably the world's simplest method is called the nearest neighbor method. Here's what you do. Let's say you just have a two-class problem, A and B. You get a bunch of samples of A, you get a bunch of samples of B, and here comes a new sample you're supposed to classify. You look at your new sample and you look around, you say, what's the nearest neighbor in this vector space to your new sample? Whatever the class of that nearest neighbor is, that's what I'm gonna say the new guy is. Mm -hmm. Can you think of anything simpler? We used to say it's almost like a caveman thing, the things that look alike probably are alike, you know, that's like the most primitive mm -hmm. way maybe a caveman would have done it. So it really, it probably is literally the world's simplest method for classifying patterns. And you make no assumptions about anything. I haven't said these are Gaussian distributions or anything of that nature. It's what's called non-parametric. There's no assumptions about the statistics. Right. Bunch of samples, bunch of samples. If there are five classes, you have five of these bunches of samples. Here comes a new one. What's the closest one? That's it. Here's the surprise. If you had what's called complete statistical information, you knew the statistics of these classes, which is a lot to know. Mm -hmm. The provably optimal way to classify problems is called Bayes' decision rule, Bayes' rule. 
but it relies on having this complete statistical information about these classes. Mm -hmm. And here is this nearest neighbor thing, no information statistically. Here's the big surprise. You, one can prove, and this is what I proved in my dissertation with some of Tom's insights helping, yeah. what I proved was if you have lots and lots of samples, this world's simplest pattern classification method comes within less than a factor of two of the Bayes probability of error. So okay. compared to the ideal statistical pattern classification method that relies on perfect statistical information, this world's simplest thing is within a factor of two. It's a little more complicated expression. At high numbers of sample At examples. High, exactly, with high numbers of samples. That, so that is the asymptotic analysis of your you dissertation. Could, yep. That with with more and more and more samples that asymptotically approaches the Bayes, met, Bayesian method or something. Yeah, they, for a two class problem with equal cost, it's actually two R times one minus R, which is a parabola that looks like this, okay. and which is below the two, the two, yeah. twice the risk would be a straight line, and this parabola goes like that. So it's actually better than twice the Bayes risk asymptotic, asymptotically. I could say it's the nearest better neighbor. than yeah, yeah. Hmm. So it's, if you so want to say better classifier, no, no, no. You you cannot oh. be better than the Bayes risk. It's better than twice the Bayes risk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so it say, can approach kind of half as good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, as I say, there's a parabolic curve that's less than the two slope two okay. straight lines. But just for conversational purposes, we'll say it's. No worse than twice the Bayes risk. Okay. It's a bit better than that, but and no worse. And exquisitely simple. Yeah. Hmm. So, so what is the surrounding context for a problem like that? Um, let's, uh, like, where would you use this? Well, or? yeah, what was the, why was this an interesting problem for you and for Tom? Well, so pattern classification, at least then, was a very hot, I mean, so many practical problems can be mapped into that. Um, whether it's military problems or commercial sampling problems or, I mean, all sorts of problems can be mapped into that. Commercial sampling like quality assurance and things like this. Yeah. Okay. All sorts of things. Right. I'll give you some more recent examples. Great. But, um, so it's a very active field and there's lots and lots of places where you use this kind of technology. And I'd say there's fat textbook uh, that I co-authored, full of these sorts of methods. This is your 1973 yeah, book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, so there's lots, um, there's lots of stuff. But this is the world's simplest one, and you don't have to know anything except you have to have a bunch of samples. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> so there was lots of motivation to work in this field. It was a very active research area. Lots of people publishing and so on. And um, I got these results. I'm telling you the main result, but there were a bunch of kind of follow-on <clears throat> subsidiary results, and generalizations, and so on. For example, suppose you have 20 classes and not two classes to classify. Well, there's a generalization that still works. Um, suppose you want to be computationally efficient and um, not store every single one of these patterns because it's a lot of computation. Well, I invented a ad hoc or heuristic method that doesn't have any theoretical properties but dramatically collapses the search. And for decades, nobody could find a better one than that. Um, well, I got all this, these results in like three months. Oh my God. And, um, and um, Tom, in the three months, I want to basically had everything, um, working furiously. I'll tell you funny stories. I was, it was very mathematical stuff. It's very, very esoteric mathematics. And I was having, I was struggling with something and I went over to see one of the most brilliant stati mathematical statisticians at Stanford. It was a, I can't quite remember his name. It was a Chinese professor who had translated a fundamental work from Russian to English. That gives wow. you an idea. Yeah. Somebody listening to this will know who it is. I forget <laughs> his name. 
I went over to see him. He asked me about this. I was looking for help. And he says, do you know the dominated convergence theorem, which sounds almost pornographic, but it is a mathematical theorem called the dominated convergence theorem. I said, oh, yes. He says, do you know Jensen's inequality? I said, oh, yes. He said to me, oh, you know enough. He said, no, you have to be smarter. So in time, I was smarter. And I used the dominated convergence theorem and Jensen's inequality, which I had already been trying to work with. And I proved everything that needed to be proved. So. Um, Tom's going, <clears throat> getting ready to go away for the summer to MIT, I think it was. I had all these results, but it's like three months. You know, you don't get a Stanford PhD dissertation in three months. Right. So he said, while you're away, why don't you try to generalize the mathematical assumptions? And I said, it's an extremely mathematical thesis. And he, I can tell you what it was to all measurable functions as opposed to all functions continuous almost everywhere. Nobody who's not a mathematician will understand what I just said. Let's just say I already had a very general proof, and he said, could you make it super general? OK. That's Thank the, you. That's the, yeah, for, forget, forget <laughs> that, that translation is helpful So for me. I almost rolled my eyes like, I couldn't do this. So I said, OK. He went away for the summer. And that summer, Diane and I decided to learn how to sail at the Stanford Sailing Club at Lake Fasona off of Highway 17. And um, Tom came back and he asked me, did you make any progress? And I honestly said, no, I didn't. And he shook his head and he said, yeah, I didn't think you would. <laughs> it was one of the times where I followed my lifelong mantra, which is always tell the truth. It always works. But it doesn't mean you have to say everything that you know. <laughs> so I didn't happen to add that I didn't try very hard. <laughs> it was totally unsolvable. Yeah. Anyway, so I uh, and so that was that, and I got signed off, and I was done, and I, you know, was signed off by the time I was 25. Wow. So you you went very quickly through that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not claiming it was a new land speed record, but it wasn't too shabby. So that. That's interesting because I had already seen that, you know, there was three years between the master's and the PhD, but if you factor in that time with Philco Ford, slowing down your pace, then it's actually once you were, the time you were actually really at it. Pretty snappy. Very quick. Yeah. So I thought I would fast forward yes. on this stuff. So, and you were asking me where's the stuff used. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you what people have told me and before I do, I will tell you, I don't know how anybody can know this. Mm -hmm. But I'm told that the nearest neighbor rule is the world's most widely used pattern classification rule. And some of this comes from technical friends at Google who say that Google uses it for all sorts of internal purposes that maybe are known to many people but are not known to me. I don't know whether it's checking songs or, you know, copyright infringement, I don't know where. But technical people, um, in fact, a good technical friend of mine once introduced me to one of his colleagues and he said, yeah, he said, Peter's the guy that proved this stuff <clears throat> about the nearest neighbor rule and that's why we use it in all these applications. So you're the historian or your colleagues will have to figure that out in more detail. I, I don't know anymore, but it is obviously very widely used and it's widely used because it's simple and because it has these theoretical properties that are very desirable, and because much smarter people later on found ways to do approximately the same thing with much less computation. Hmm. And the and computation is involved in well, storing the comparisons? Of, storing zillions of samples and computing the distances. Okay, right. And so, and, and in these high dimensional spaces that gets more costly and right. so <clears throat> I haven't followed that area for a long time, but I do understand right. that there are methods that have really sped that up while being, you know, maybe a little suboptimal, but close and much faster. So that's a typical trade-off that people make. Is there, is there a distinction that makes a difference between the phrases pattern classification and pattern recognition? Not really. Okay. They're nearly synonymous. Yeah. Thank you. Pattern classification maybe sounds a little more mathematical. I mentioned you transform the real world problem to a vector space. 
Right. And so pattern classification is kind of what do you do in the vector space? And maybe pattern recognition is a little more generic, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, I don't think there's a big difference. Okay. And is that problem of pattern classification intrinsically related to what might be called machine vision? Not as much as one would hope. So uh, when Dick Duda and I, and Dick Duda is another legend, uh, wrote this first edition of Pattern Classification and Scene Analysis, it was basically two half books, part one and part two. Part one was the mathematical pattern classification part, mm -hmm. and part two was the scene analysis part. Yes. Um, and we thought, you know, they're sort of be related and would grow together and we should put them in the same book. That did not happen. Mm. And so they, they are, for the most part, fairly distinct. And in the last five or eight years with deep learning, they've become very, very different. Right. Very, very different. Hmm. Well, I, I, we'll get to that when we... Sure. Um, in this... Did you have any connections with the Stanford Research Institute while you were doing this work with None. Tom? None. None. Um, when does that, I mean, it seems like you went over there almost immediately after getting your PhD, is that correct? Yes. How did that, how did that come about? It happened two ways. So I mentioned handball playing. Yeah. And uh, at RPI, I became a four-wall handball player, which is even more obscure. And there was, at the time, a small gym in Menlo Park, long since gone, that had a four-wall handball court. And one of the <clears throat> people I played with was exactly the same age as my father, and he was a vice president at SRI. And he decided that maybe I could do more than play handball, and he was going to introduce me to people. In parallel, but, and he told me about that, in parallel but unknown to me, Tom Cover had a relationship with the people who, first it was called the Learning Machine Group, and then it became called the, <coughs> called the Artificial Intelligence Group. Charlie Rosen and Nils Nilsson, I'll speak more about them later because they yes. deserve some, some focus. And between these two, I had an interview, and I, I can describe a little bit about that, and I, I was you know, quickly hired. Uh, so we were, you're heading over to the Stanford Research Institute and um, to talk to the artificial intelligence group. Uh, so What did so, you see in here? Well, so as a preface for this, I'll say I was beyond lucky to hook up at the right time with the most wonderful, remarkable, extraordinary talents that you could imagine. Um, and I'll mention three, Charlie Rosen, Nils Nilsson, and Dick Duda. So Charlie interviewed me, and uh, he asked me a couple of questions, and then he drew something on the whiteboard, and it was a graph with a curve, and he asked me, told me about something about it, and he asked me what I thought about it. And I look at it and I said, that doesn't make any sense at all. And he looks and he says, oh, and he phrases it. <laughs> so I got hired. Uh, uh, Nils, of course, is legendary, and Dick interviewed me. And I thought, Dick is the clearest, most brilliant, most gentlemanly person. You couldn't invent that. I mean, Dick is just fabulous. And so I, I took the job. I was offered being the head of a group at Lockheed, and I was offered other positions around the country. And I thought, who's doing the most interesting stuff, and where will I learn the most? And it was so obvious. So I was there. What were, those, uh, what were the other opportunities? I mean, I think that's interesting to compare them oh, to what I don't even remember. I remember at. Lockheed wanted me to be the head of a lab. And I thought, I don't know anything. <laughs> I remember that one specifically. I don't remember all the others, but mm. it was just so clear that this was the place to be. And could you describe SRI at this moment? So we're, we're now in 1966. Six. Um, just the, 
the context of the place? What was it like? Was it bustling with activity? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> because of uh, something else I do, I serve on the board of the, of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And I'm doing a project there. And as part of that, I was interviewing Bill Mark, who's the president of the Information Technology Division of SRI. It hasn't changed. Mm. Um, the modus operandi, the business model, certain aspects have changed, but the basic operation is same. So it's terrific. Lots going on all over the place. Um, um, fast forwarding just a little bit, I was down the hall from Doug Engelbart when he was doing his stuff. I was in the famous Mother of All Demos. I was in the audience. Oh. Doug and his wife and Diane and I used to go backpacking in the Yosemite. Believe it or not, I'm one of the few people who have the honor of having skinny dipped with Doug. <laughs> Um, but uh, so it, it was terrific intellectual uh, tone and of course it was the glory days of ARPA maybe pre DARPA yeah. uh, and you know you had the smartest people in the world working on some of the most interesting most important people in the world with not lavish but adequate funding and as I later used to tell people if you don't like this I really think you need to find some other chosen profession because it's not going to get any better mm. So it was, it, was, it was fabulous. And Charlie Rosen had a big chunk of it. Well, Charlie was the head of first the AI group and then the AI center got renamed. Let me talk a little bit about Charlie because yeah. he's an individual who I think has not gotten nearly the recognition that he deserves. Charlie is one of only two or three people I've met in a very long career who truly deserves the over worked labels of renaissance, man, polymath, uh, no known bandwidth limitations, DC to light. <laughs> uh, Charlie was beyond phenomenal. Mm. And uh, he had, knew about communication theory, he knew about industrial automation from his World War II experience in Britain. Uh, he did early stuff in learning machines. You know he was a co-founder of Ridge Vineyards, which is a very famous local high-end boutique vineyard, uh, winery, not just vineyard, but winery. Um, he was into hydroponics. He knew a lot about fine art. Uh, he was just everywhere, and he had the, such an associative mind. Uh, he'd put together ideas from such different fields of endeavor and make the connections and you know nine times out of ten it was screwy but one time out of ten it was brilliant right. uh, uh, he had this enormous knowledge base insatiable reader sp just soaked up everything and as one of my best professors at Stanford Bill Linville used to say you can't invent with something in a book you can only invent with what's in your head mm. you need what he called portable concept you can always look up the details later to invent you need stuff in your head mm. Charlie had it. Uh, he was also um, also a fabulous mentor. I mean, he mentored scores of people and, uh, and a terrific humanitarian. I mean, you just cannot say enough. He also, we were in the group yesterday and the day before about early companies. He was the principal founder of Machine Intelligence Corp. Right. Uh, uh, as well as Ridge and well as some other, other things. But um, maybe I'll tell one story about Charlie that's also a little bit about my career. This fast Please forwards do. a little bit. This, well, let me, let me we'll give go, a little bit we'll of background. Yeah. So I worked uh, very quickly uh, at SRI. I started on the Shaky the Robot project on day one, and maybe we'll talk more about Shaky okay. later. Okay, <clears throat> interesting. I was but, wondering but, uh, about that timing. That, um, I worked on Shaky from the day it officially started to the day I, I was the head of the project, and I I'll tell you a little, a little bit about what I did at various stages, but I also worked on the world's first, uh, first program to recognize human faces, which was done for an unmentionable agency, but, um, but it was, the, I mean, it was 30 years before anybody else did it, uh, <clears throat> and, and of course not publishable. Uh, so I worked on stuff like that. And uh, in Shaky, I worked on, um, I worked on um, almost every part of artificial intelligence that then existed other than natural language processing. And you could do it then because almost nothing had been done. 
and I don't know where you'd like the conversation to go at this point. I can tell well, you about I, I those have things. Well, I have kind of a detailed roster of some of the things go that you were involved in, but I would love to hear the story that you wanted to tell about Charlie Rosen and your career. So th this, this, um, so um, on the Shaky Project itself, <clears throat> I worked very quickly on something called the A star algorithm, which is a shortest path algorithm, yeah. which I did with Nils Nilsson and Burt Rayfield. <clears throat> I guess I was a lead author, maybe just for alphabetic reasons. Um, and that A star algorithm is the foundation of all everybody's root finding today. When you have your root computed for you, A star is doing the heavy lifting, even though it's got layers of newer stuff on top. And in fact, that same algorithm in a slightly different form is what um, navigates the Mars rover because there's like a 40 minute or an hour oh, transmission. You, sure. can't, you can't drive a car when it takes an hour between when you do this and you see something. Right. So, so A star, it's also by the way what computes the path of characters in video games. Uh, so A star is everywhere either in its original form or with several layers of elaboration. So I worked on stuff like that. We invented A star at that time. But the main thing I worked on initially was the computer vision part, which is not the same as pattern classification. Mm. And so shaking, absolutely, it was mission critical. Shaking needed some way to know what was around it for it to do anything. And to give you an example of what we were working with, everything was homemade. You couldn't buy even an A to D converter. Mm. We had to make it. <clears throat> and so Shakey's vision system the robot that's downstairs in this museum, um, I will tell you, delivered digital images at a, resolu <coughs> at a resolution of 120 by 120 pixels, four bits deep. So 16 levels of gray from black to white on 120 pixel squared grid. Try to get your head around those numbers the next time you look at your smartphone and you see what your uh, camera does yeah. and you know how many thousands right. and millions of colors and, and so forth. So this was early. So here's a story about Charlie and about me. This really was a turning point in my life. Mm -hmm. And it was because of Charlie. And Charlie had me in his office and um, here's the scene. He and I were standing literally toe to toe. His famously bushy black eyebrows were quivering. He jabbed me in the chest with a surprisingly sturdy forefinger and he demanded to know, what are you scared of? That's an opener. So what's the story? Charlie had just asked me to become head of the computer, what we called the vision group. It was the computer scene analysis, computer vision group. And I was being a little hesitant. And that's what provoked this sharp poke in the chest and what he's scared of. Well, I was the youngest person in the group, the least experienced. The, um, we were having trouble making progress. Mm -hmm. The world's entire literature on computer vision of three-dimensional scenes consisted of exactly one worthwhile paper mm. done by a bril <coughs> brilliant guy named Larry Roberts at MIT. Oh, yeah, sure. And we were trying to apply some of Larry's stuff to the shaky situation and hadn't gotten very far. And. Yeah, I was being a little hesitant. Wouldn't one of the more experienced people be better? And I, I was a little hesitant. But here's what that poke in the chest provoked. I started asking myself, yeah, what are you scared of? So I started thinking, I started developing a few alternative scenarios as to how the future might unfold if I took this job. I mean, right. the upside was obvious. It'd be great, you know, we're in the few groups in the world, I'd be the head. Upside was obvious. The downside. So I, I, I started thinking about these alternative scenarios, and for each I asked myself, was it survivable? Was the worst case survivable? Professionally, maybe even economically, you know, in, in various ways. 
And the answer was, well, of course it's survivable. So I took the job. Mm. And that experience set a lifelong pattern for me. Because whenever I'm considering alternatives, they may be opportunities, they may be how to deal with present issues, current yeah. issues, I habitually try to envision the most likely scenarios and the worst case outcome. If it's a business deal, you know, where's the exit door on this deal if it doesn't go the way I want? You know, what'll it cost? Mm. And I'm always asking, is it survivable? Maybe not so much for me, but for the organization that I'm running, let's right. say, right. or for what, whatever. And most of the time, you discover that, yeah, the downside is manageable. Of course, there are always boundaries, but they're usually much further out than you initially imagine. I mean, there are limits, like I'm not gonna play high stakes poker with you know Zuckerberg and Bill Gates. <laughs> and I'm not thinking of, I don't know, crossing Niagara Falls on a high wire. I mean, you know, there obviously yeah, yeah, there are yeah, limits, yeah, yeah. but they're usually further out than you think. And for me, that pattern of thought that began with that poke in the chest has been absolutely liberating because it's allowed me to try all sorts of adventurous things, exciting things that I wouldn't otherwise have tried. Mm. And it's one of the things that got me away from this very risk averse, cautious upbringing that I talked about earlier about taking chances and right. be careful and right. so on and so forth. And the fundamental strategy is, will you be able to manage the downside if the downside happens and maybe it happens in three different ways but if the downside is manageable and the upside is worth it you can take the chance so that pattern of thought has been absolutely liberating for me it's been lifelong and it all started with Charlie asking what are you scared of good question <laughs> um, turns out not much <laughs> <laughs> well let's um, so, so I went on, I became head of the vision group. Uh, not too much later, I became head of the whole project. Right. So at, at Jakey's Peak, I was the, the project leader. And not too much after that, I became head of the artificial intelligence center there. So that, that poke in the chest really set a path. Well, let's, let's, let's begin to dig into the Shakey sure. story. Um, You started on day one of the project. What's well, I, I, I started, yeah, I started on, on the project. Not my first day at SRI was some little month or two mismatch, but I started first on the first day, day of, of the, the project. Effort. Yeah. What's the lead up to the effort? Where does it come from? What's the discussion about it? It's a great what, question. What did the sponsors think? Perfect question. Yeah. And, I, and I happen to know the history in quite some detail. So it was Charlie Rosen's inspiration and Charlie's inspiration was to build a single experimental test bed for integrating all of the subfields of artificial intelligence as then understood. So that included scene analysis, problem solving, uh, language, natural language, uh, learning, I mean, anything you can think of we wanted to integrate into a single experimental platform. Mm -hmm. And Charlie, at some point with help from Nils Nilsson, Charlie started promoting that probably two or three years before. And he promoted it to ARPA, and I think it was Ivan Sutherland, who was at ARPA at the time, who wrote a memo saying, yeah, this is great, we should go do it. There's some memo. You know, Nils Nilsson has his book, The Quest for Artificial Intelligence, which is a history of very comprehensive history up to a few years ago. And he has some of, I think, the original documents uh, in there, perhaps. Uh, well, then Ivan Sutherland left the head of the, dir the director's position, and Charlie had to do a reset, but eventually got, it might have been a half million dollars, and if you look up the um, GDP deflator, there's about a factor of six mm -hmm. from then till now. Uh, so that would be maybe like a $3 million grant today, something in that ballpark. And so that's what got it off the ground. Now, interestingly enough, we didn't dare call it a robot because you have to remember that until Shaky, robots literally were fictional. 
you know where the word comes from, the, sure. the play, and you know the, uh, the toy robots and the science fiction robots and so forth. So we called it an automaton. And because it was the Department of Defense, it had to have a mission, and so the mission was going to be reconnaissance. And if you look at the initial proposal, it was for an automaton for re reconnaissance applications. But that was basically a cover story. And uh, the real motivation was a test bed for integrating all of artificial intelligence technologies That's that then existed. And so, the, and so the concept was we weren't necessarily going to advance any of the individual parts of AI. We were going to integrate them. Except, as I mentioned in the story about computer vision, the part didn't exist. So we had to do a lot of invention. And the same thing was true for root finding, and so we had to do some invention. But that's what research is about. For you in particular, when you, when did you, well, did you see your work in pattern classification as being part of artificial intelligence when you first, in those first three months where you really got it? We didn't think about it much. We didn't care about the classifications. It's whatever problem was interesting and whatever technology was applicable, that's all we thought about. We didn't really think about the taxonomy of the field, so to speak. When you were initially doing the pattern I classification. I never did. You didn't, but no. then, but did, when did you feel like you were you know, or may maybe, well, did you come to identify as being part of an AI community at Instantly. some point? Instantly. Instantly. Very quickly. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, I mentioned the um, facial recognition stuff, so that had a classification aspect, obviously. Sure. Um, but it quickly became obvious that the statistical methods that are kind of foundational uh, were not going to be very helpful in this world of robots. Uh, the scene analysis stuff, for example, was very obvious. You needed to know some mathematics. For example, I worked out the mathematics of prospective transformations for probably the hundredth time in a hundred years, but, you know, I did it, you know, for us so we could do the projective geometry. Yeah. So, for example, if the camera was here and looking down and you saw a point, you knew that's where it was in the real world if it intersected a floor and you knew where the floor was. And the mathematics was useful elsewhere. I worked on something in vision. There's something called the Huff Transform you may have heard of. Oh, uh, that's on this list, yeah. yeah. So um, that had nothing to do with classification, but it did have to do with some mathematics, not very complicated mathematics. I don't know if you want to talk about that story. I do, but I, I want to, want to follow this dig into the, well, I just, um, it just, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a, that integrative project is also very <laughs> expansive. So it, um, I just wanted to chase down a couple lines and then, and then get into, um, well, just tr tack down a couple things. Was the, your facial recognition effort for the three letter agency, was that before? Before. Shaky. Before and separate. Yeah. Interesting, okay. And um, so I suppose that's kind of like, well, it's a pattern classification in part. Um, it was really a combination because there is a, a photograph visual. of a face and then there's right. a classification. So it was one of the examples where you did need to do both. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And um, in terms of, well, uh, your comment about the paper on machine vision by Larry Roberts evoked for me the question about, you know, he was also doing the, Larry Roberts that is, I think in the same period is doing this work on computer graphics and the block worlds and, and things yeah, we like. We didn't, that was un, un, unrelated. I was wondering if, if some of the you know, as you were talking about these transforms and perspectives, you know, is is there a relationship between some of that? Mathematics is the same, yeah. The mathematics are the same. but In the vision and the graphics. Yeah, there's the you know, sort of output and input, you might say. Yeah. Uh, but um, the blocks world came at MIT, to some extent Stanford, but uh, probably a year or two or three after Shaky started. Okay. 
you, you can check, I don't know the exact dates. I but, don't uh, know, yeah. But I think probably just a little bit, little bit later. Okay. Yeah. Um, so these, pr these perspective transformations, this is 100 year old mathematics, it's nothing that we had to invent, we just had to you know, apply it correctly. And um, just you mentioned Doug Engelbart and his laboratory. I guess that was, yeah, it was, it was going by the time you arrived. Um, was there a lot of, what was, the, what was the interaction and circulation of ideas like between Not much. Shakey I mean, and we were Engelbart. friendly. Uh, Doug and I would go to principal investigator, you know, ARPA PI meetings, right. for, for example, together. There was some, a little bit of movement of personnel. I think Jeff Rulofson, for example, might have been one person who moved between or oh. something. But um, for the most part, we were sister groups doing different stuff and, you know, sort of aware. I saw the demos in the first mouse and so forth, but we really didn't work together in any meaningful way. And one of the people who, one of the laboratories that Charlie Rosen had... Um, it was called the Applied Physics Lab. Well there, was, well, there was also, within that, there was Ken Shoulder's microelectronics operation. Yeah, that was that the Applied Physics down Lab. Yeah. by that time? Yeah. That was kind yeah. of at the end Ken, of that. Ken was there when I joined, but that ended at some point. In fact, Ted Brain, another physicist, English physicist, there was a shoulder, a brain, and a heart, so you can imagine lots of jokes about that. <laughs> and did you have, I mean, I've, uh, it was a very interesting project, am, ambitious project in terms of microelectronics from that era. Did you have any impression or interaction with shoulders and his group? No, just social. Yeah. No. Okay, well, to get back into Shaky then, I was just, um, how did, did your nearest neighbor rule work come directly into the Shaky effort? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Simple answer. Um, and then, so, and the A star alg search algorithm was was the initial work that you got into on Shaky. Is that correct? It was probably in parallel with the vision stuff. I don't remember exactly okay. what it was. I mean, the, sh the A star algorithm was a really nice little story. I would love to hear um, that. It's had such so, a long life. Yes. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, okay. I'll tell the story yes. briefly. So Nils Nelson and Burt Raphael had cooked up this algorithm. One of them had some idea and told the other, I can't remember which was first, and then the other one said, here's a way to make it better. Yeah. And then I was just walking down the hall and see them in the office and I dropped by to see what they're doing and they showed me what they said, we think this is a way we can navigate shaky. So I understood it was very simple. Um, and I went home and thought about it, and I still remember sitting in an armchair and staring at the opposite wall of the living room and thinking, you know, this algorithm is special. I can see, I, I didn't have all, all the steps of the mathematical proof in my head, mm -hmm. but I was absolutely certain that we'd be able to mathematically prove two things about this algorithm. First, it always works. It will always find the shortest path or the least cost path. And you know, the models, you have a network and the network has numbers on the arcs between the intersections like yes. distance or time or something. Mm -hmm. And you want to find a path from A to B that minimizes the sum of those. That's the statement of the problem. Yeah. Um, this will always find the shortest path. I said, and then I thought, not only that, but I'll bet that I can prove that it will do this computation with less effort than any other conceivable algorithm that's also guaranteed to find the shortest path. Now, if you do something like always turn right, that might be faster, but it won't always work. <laughs> I get it. So, yeah. so you've, you've got to, so mathematically, uh, you can use a term from statistics like admissibility, like we'll only consider admissible algorithms, admissible algorithms are those that are guaranteed to always work under all circumstances. Mm -hmm. 
And then if you consider the class of admissible algorithms, this will do the least amount of computation. And then there's some other refinement because this was a heuristic algorithm, which means that it has a kind of a look-ahead function. Mm -hmm. And look-ahead functions can be anything you want. And so if your algorithm uses a far more complicated look-ahead function, for example, maybe it secretly goes ahead and solves a whole graph mm -hmm. and then comes back and say, look what I've got. So you need some notion of when the look-ahead functions are comparable or more or less informed. So you, you need some niceties to kind of make it a well-posed problem. But if you say you compare A star to any other conceivable algorithm that always works and that doesn't have any more information than you give A star, that other algorithm cannot do less computation. That's pretty attractive. And that's what, uh, well, that's what made it so widely used, and it also was what um, created almost a cottage industry of elaborations and refinements. So for example, in practice today, if you want to go from Mountain View to Times Square, and you say to Google Maps or something, plot me a route, compute me a route, Google Maps may have an absolute detailed street map of the entire US, but A star will not operate, or its search algorithm will not operate on that level, where it considers every conceivable turn, it'll be hierarchical. It'll say, oh, let's get in a couple of stages to the freeway system, and now we'll compute it at the freeway system, and then when we get close to New York, then we'll go back down to the, the surface. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not provably optimal anymore, but it's a lot faster. Mm. And so there are things like that that, uh, that are what's used and practiced in practice today, but the right. core, the heavy lifting is still, is still a star. And that was, that was kind of a mathematical intuition that you had? Yeah, I can tell you how I thought about it. The way I thought about it was in terms of optimistic and pessimistic algorithms. Mm. And so I th we, we thought that if this look ahead function, he here you are, you're a computer program exploring this network. Yeah. And you're at some intermediate intersection, which way shall I turn left or right or go straight? And there's the goal. My look ahead function is gonna be very simple. You can have many, but here's a very useful and simple one. I'm gonna compute the airline distance from this intersection to the goal, mm -hmm. to my destination. Mm -hmm. That's really easy to compute and it's a lower bound on the actual road cost, right? Whatever the road distance is, it's gonna be longer. And so as long as that look ahead function is a lower bound on the actual true cost, unknown at the moment, but whatever it is, then A star will be optimal and maximally efficient. And I thought about it in terms of, op of optimism and pessimism. I said, you know, this A star algorithm is optimistic because it thinks gosh, maybe I can get there that, <laughs> that fast. That quickly, yeah. It's optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if A star chooses a right turn at this point or a left turn at this point, and your algorithm, your competing algorithm does not, you might miss it. Because you cannot rule out, based on the information you have, that might be the, sh the shortest route. Mm -hmm. So any algorithm that fails to explore the possible paths that my A star algorithm is exploring cannot be guaranteed to always find the shortest route. It's mm. got to miss something, mm. as long as it has no additional information. Right. Anyway, that was the intuition, and it only took us weeks. Uh, Burton, Nils, and I were running into each other's offices nonstop and so on and so forth, and, and we got a mathematical proof. And how do you... And forgive the ignorance of this question because it is just my ignorance, but you've got an algorithm, okay? And that's, you know, a set of explicit kind of rules and procedure. And um, I'm wondering what is, so you need a language, a mathematical language that is descriptive of the algorithm so you could come up with a proof like mm -hmm. this. What kind of mathematics is that? Hmm. You know, what is that mathematical language for doing these sorts of proofs about algorithms? 
You know, that's a really good question. I'm not quite sure how to answer it. It's not pseudocode. It's right. not a programming language that you're right. manipulating. Uh, <clears throat> you're describing the algorithm. Well, the pseudocode is extremely simple. Uh, it's saying, here's, here's the algorithm. You're going to start at the start, and you're going to expand, which means where's all the places you can get to in one jump without going through many more nodes on a graph or intersections on a map. Right. And now you're at this set of things, and here's what you're going to compute at each of these intersections or nodes. I'll tell you exactly how it's going to be computed. And based on the results of those computations, here is the node from which you're going to generate the next set of offspring, the next set of root segments. Right. And so that's the language in which you describe that. And then the proof says, well, um, um, the reason it's optimal, there are two things to prove, right? That it always works and that it's minimum computation. Yeah. Minimum computation, by the way, is not in terms of computational complexity. It's in terms of the number of nodes that your algorithm expands, that it visits and sprouts segments from. Mm -hmm. So we didn't do it in terms of computational complexity, which was in its infancy at the time. Uh, but in terms of how many nodes have to be expanded, you generate the successors. You know, I'm at this intersection, am I going to go and look at the next right. set? Right, which would be, to, sounds to me like it is, you know, just intuitively, the more nodes you have to do that expansive work on, the, the more, work. more cost of the and machine that, and that worrying exactly, away. And yeah. that was exactly our approach. We would yeah. use the number of nodes expanded as a proxy for computation. Yeah. That's pretty reasonable. So I'm sorry, you were saying... I don't so know that I have a better explanation. Yeah. So you, you describe the algorithm in that way, and then you prove the admissibility, in other words, it always works, by saying that at the time that the algorithm terminates with a path, every other possible route that's been partially but not fully explored is guaranteed to be more costly. Mm. Yeah. So it's safe to stop searching because everything else is going to be longer distance or short, longer time or more costly by whatever the, measure, whatever the measure is. So that's that's the way. So it's the same sort of proof that you would be doing in um, propositional logic yeah. or in geometry, yeah. that kind of yeah. way of It's not calculus, it's not statistics, it's yeah, not modern algebra it. with group theory. Right. It's kind of a strict mathematical, analytical sort of thing, I'm not sure. I get it, yeah. I get it. And, and what did that, um, with the articulation of the A star algorithm and this proof in hand, um, you know, was your thought, wow, we really have something great that we're going to use for shaky, or, you know, boy, we've just come across a really general purpose. Tool. The latter. The latter. And uh, I, I'm not sure how much we actually use it for shaky because the search spaces were so small that we might not have needed it all the time. Right. But here's the interesting thing from a historical perspective. The three of us, Bert, Rayfield, Nils Nilsson, and myself, thought, man, this is dynamite. You have to remember that in artificial intelligence, and we considered this part of artificial intelligence, there's almost never a mathematical proof of anything. I mean, in formal logic, you can say, yes, this is a sound proof procedure and so forth. But most of the stuff in AI, you don't prove things. And this is a heuristic thing because we have this heuristic look-ahead function like the airline distance. And so to be able to prove something that solid and that practical, and by the way, I always say the most practical thing in the world is a good theory because if you have a good theory, it lets you know the properties of what it is you're planning to do. You don't need to do a thousand experiments. You know the properties. Mm. Mm -hmm. So here is something, the, the theory matches the practice and I can prove the properties. We thought this is dynamite. Couldn't get it published anywhere. Hmm. Well, there was no natural home for there it? There was, or? and they kept rejecting us. So for example... What was that? Well, for uh, we, we would put it in, uh, I, I think, I don't remember exactly. I think we got rejected at least from the um, 
the ACM journal, mm -hmm. and from the CACM, if I recall. I can't remember for sure, but um, I might have given you previously a box of materials that might have had that. Okay, <laughs> well, sure. I'll look for it. Anyway. Um, I don't remember seeing it. I don't know. Anyway, um, and I think the reason was something like the following. Now, the reviewers are anonymous, and they don't tell you every detail of their rationale for rejecting it. So to some extent, I'm reading between the lines. Yeah. Ed McCluskey was the editor, and uh, we teased him long later, and he said, what can I tell you? I got three reviews, and they were all negative, you know? <laughs> but um, do I have the name right? Ed, Mc Ed McCluskey, remember I the name? I think that's yeah. the right anyway, name. So here's what I think happens. Um, the editor gets this, for whichever journal it was, the editor gets this manuscript, flips the pages, and sees that it's full of theorems. Boy, you don't get that too often. Theorems? Better give it to a mathematician. So you find some mathematician. The mathematician skims the paper, and he sees that, what, for what I will tell you were very technical reasons, I had to put in a condition in order to make the proofs go through. I had to put in a condition, remember I said every arc on the graph has to have a number which is a cost, like the time yeah, or distance to prefer. This is the weights, so to speak. Well, not really is the weight, it's really a cost. cost. It's really a cost function, it's okay. a metric. Okay. And you're going to minimize the sum. Mm -hmm. So think of it as distance in the case yeah. of that. Okay. Great, yeah. So for very technical reasons, I had to put in a as a condition of proving these theorems, that the cost of every arc yep. was bounded away from zero. In other words, I couldn't allow a sequence of arcs to have ever diminishing costs that approach zero but never get to zero, because then the path length can become infinite. So for that very technical mathematical reason, I had to say that the cost of every arc was at least some number bigger than anything you like. It could be 10 to the minus 6, but you've got to give me a number and say that's always bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Well, what that means is that, um, um, let me think about this a second. That might have been one reason. The other reason is that I think I might have had to have a finite graph. In other words, you're not allowed to have an infinite number of nodes because well, the then that would never nothing terminate. will ever finish. Yeah. yeah. So I think what might have happened, and this is just conjecture, but yeah. it's, as Carl Sagan used to say, this is consistent with the observables. You cannot disprove <laughs> <laughs> my conjecture. It's probably but all it, of history. <laughs> but it, yeah, yeah. But, it, but it may not be yeah. right. I think what could have happened is a mathematician, mathematician looks at it and says, hey, this whole thing is just for finite graphs. Who cares about finite graphs? They're trivial mm -hmm. from a mathematical perspective because a mathematician might not appreciate that there's a difference between a graph with 10 nodes and a graph with, let's say, 10 to the 100th nodes. Right. But for computer scientists, it's that everything, matters. Everything, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's just speculation. It's fun to wonder. We'll never know. But we kept getting rejection after rejection. My fa we finally sent it into the IEEE transactions on, maybe it was called system science and mm -hmm. cybernetics, the name changed over time. Yeah. And they published it. And you know, the rest, as you would say, is history. <laughs> well, what was the reaction of the community once you got it out there? I don't know. And, <laughs> and uh, I sort of ignored it. We went on to other stuff, and then years later, you find out it's one of the most cited papers. <laughs> so that really, I mean, weird. that honestly, you didn't know that no. people were using it so much. No. Really? No. Huh. That's surprising. Went on to other stuff. You know, so, so some people, you know, mine the same research vein for a very long time. No, that does not and seem to be that your not, case. That was not my path. <laughs> well, um, I just wanted to, I thought maybe we could spend um, just talking about the shaky project, yeah. you know, um, and talk about just, 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 so it ran from 66, 66 to, to 72. 72. 
And in those years, was it, did the group rapidly expand? No, no, the, the um, of course the shaky hardware was very primitive. And the reason we called it shaky, and the reason it shook, by the way, was I think because of the stepping motors that we used. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but the software will change the world. Um, and after the hardware was built, there was a separate hardware team, and they pretty much dissipated, except maybe for very occasional maintenance or something. Mm -hmm. So it didn't really grow. It probably shrunk a bit, a bit over time. But there were uh, there were a few core people who were there from beginning to end: uh, Nils, me, Dick Duda, I think Bert Rayfield, probably Richard Feigs for at least a good part of it, uh, and I'm sure Helen Wolf. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm sure I'm leaving out, you know, a number of other. Could you talk about her role? She was the, that was the only yes. female appearing name that I, I read. I have proposed publicly, including when there was the shaky event, when it became an IEEE milestone in history. Yeah. I propose Helen as being the Lady Ada Lovelace of robotics. Wow. Because my particular opinion, and it's hard to really establish this, Mike Wilbur was there very early too, a programmer. I think Helen has a pretty strong claim to being the world's first programmer of robots. That is to say, she wasn't uh, a researcher, she wouldn't claim to be. There were other systems, we had a very important systems honcho named Len Chaitin, who lives up in Oregon now who was responsible for first the SDS 940 and then the PDP-10 that replaced it, mm -hmm. and the PDP-15 combination. I mean, there were certainly other people writing software, but in terms of people who actually had their job primarily as a programmer, as someone who implemented ideas from somewhere, um, I think Helen has a pretty good claim, and I've you know, made that argument quite a few, quite a few times. So what was, she was programming in Lisp to? to I think she was mostly not. I was programming some stuff in Lisp, but I think she was mostly programming in, I don't know what it might have been, for the, for the vision, the detailed vision cal calculation that might have been Fortran, I don't remember what it was. Was she, that what she, I mean, she was she? She worked on the vision, calcula, vision calculations, like the perspective transformation, okay. for example. And I think she probably implemented the Huff transform. For me, if I remember, we use that we use that a lot. The Huff in quotes Huff. It's actually I should have. It was a little too modest to rename it, but yeah, uh, that was turned out to be very very important, and that allowed us to make much less use of the range finder that we ever thought we would need. And the range finder was like a laser. And it was a laser. It was homemade. Uh, if you look at Shaky downstairs, you'll see it's got two lenses. One is the video, actually a Viticon tube camera. Uh -huh. The other is the pickup lens for the rangefinder. If you look in this aluminum angular casing, if you ever peer inside, what you'll see is a three-sided mirror. Oh. And that three-sided mirror spun. Spinning. And there was a little laser pointing up, and that mirror would sweep a vertical beam, and the lens would pick it up, and when you looked at the angle of the mirror and you knew the separation, you could do the triangulation and you knew how oh. far away. So it was not time of flight, it was a triangulating, yeah. homemade triangulating. Ted Brain, the English physicist, developed that. But we made almost no use of it because it turned out that we could, see those baseboards over here? Yes. Um, we could make use of things like the baseboards of the room and my version of the Huff transform to figure out fairly accurately where Shaky was. And that was used to update the error that accumulated in the dead reckoning. Because I mentioned these stepping motors, mm -hmm. which caused the shaking. So it's counting as it moves. Yeah, counted the pulses. But of course, dead reckoning error accumulates. And so we would periodically update the, uh, update the uh, thing. But you know, sometimes surprising things happened. So every now and then we would do experiments that were very lengthy and laborious and you didn't do it every day or every week. But every now and then, Shaky would stop in the middle of whatever was doing, and it would do a pirouette. It would like do a 360 or something, and then it would continue on its way like nothing ever happened. Like, what was that all about? So Mike Wilbur, another programmer, 
I think it was he who dug into the code, and this is what we found. The first couple of years or so, or more of Shakey's life, it was connected to the computer by a giant cumbersome umbilical cord that went through a pulley arrangement in the ceiling. Yes. And the reason was it took us forever to get FCC approval for experimental use of a radio link. And so it turned out that buried somewhere in the code was a little piece of code that counted the revolutions that Shaky had made and would reverse it to unwind the cable oh so the cable gosh. didn't get <laughs> The one thing that Shaky did that totally surprised us and it had this funny low level <laughs> reason, you know, years later we have a radio link and we had all forgotten about about that. Oh, so that was an artifact left over from the from tether. the cable. Oh my God! Yeah, from from the, it was quite. If you look at the uh, the pictures of the day, the photographs is quite a heavy bundle actually, a bundle of cables, uh, and so that was that was really quite. Um, let me tell you one other story from a. a yes, please, uh, please do. From about that year, it might have been a little bit later, I, but if we're so far into the future that if we have a few years round off error, we're not going to worry about it. So did I tell you my story about the government auditor? No. This is one for the annals. <clears throat> so one day, I get a call from our contracts office saying the government auditor is coming. Which they come, I don't know, once a year or whatever. So in other words, I should be on my best behavior. Well, pretty soon an auditor comes around. He might have been an ex-Marine. He was all business. He came into my office with a fat briefcase. He sat at the edge of his chair upright, no pleasantries, pulls a file out, looks at it, no preamble. He says, Dr. Hart. I'm looking around to see who's he talking to. Yeah. Of course you I guess that's me. It says here that you've taken delivery of nine billion four hundred and seventy three million something something packets of bits. Is that true? I hadn't seen that one coming. But I'm on my best behavior. So I say, well, it sounds about right. I can check it if you like it. That's all right. Literally checks it off. Next question, he says, did you set up any procedures to inspect the condition of the incoming packets? Now I can start to yeah. <laughs> where this is going. I think to myself, you know, I'll bet there's an error detecting code somewhere in the communication path. Close enough. So I said yes. Checks. Then he says to me, Dr. Hart, did those packets arrive in good condition? Was there any tarnish or corrosion on any of the bits? <laughs> Try strongly to keep a straight yeah. face. No, sir, there was no tarnish or corrosion on any of the bits. Check. Here's one last question for me. He says, and did you have adequate warehousing facilities to store all of these packets? I'm thinking, didn't you see all those disk drives in the machine room across from my office? But I was on my best behavior, so I just said yes. He thanked me, stuffed his file back in the fat briefcase. That was it. Apparently we passed. Oh my God. Crazy. You can't make this stuff Just up, crazy. right? Well, it does. That's it, what the world was like then. It does lead to the question though about what kind of computing resources were you, did you require for doing this, the whole shaky project? Well, the, 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 the big machine we started with an SDS 940 and two or three layers that got a PTP 10 with a PTP 15 was a communication controller for the robot. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> I remember signing it off on some stuff. It was, you know, as big as a room, many, many racks. My favorite rack was you open the door, it was completely blank panels, just front panels, just black panels, except for one little knob in the middle with like a cheesy 25 cent rheostat and it said, speed control, slow, fast. <laughs> I said, well, what? All the way up. 
<laughs> yeah. I don't know what it did, but I'm guessing it was a system clock, and if you pushed it too fast, you'd probably start getting bits dropping. Oh, oh, oh. I'm guessing. But anyway, <laughs> Len Chayton, the system programmer, told me he'd, you know, murder me if I touched that. <laughs> 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 but here's a statistic that you might like to know. Yes. A key part of that system was a gigantic magnetic drum made by Bryant, long defunct, that was bigger than refrigerator. It rotated on a vertical axis. It was wider than a standard 19-inch rack. And it was a swapping drum used by the timeshare system to swap jobs in oh, and out. Oh, yeah, in sure. I remember the specs on that. I signed off on that. Um, it had a 256 K word capacity and I don't remember whether they were 8 bit or 9 bit what is that um, I, th they, uh, I think it might have been 36 bit words so that's like a little more than 8 um, than 8 bit bytes so it's like a little more than a megabyte it's a little more than 4 bytes per word, so 256. So it's a little more than a megabyte. And I remember that it cost $250,000 in early 1970 dollars. And I've looked it up, and it's this factor of six. And so that's about a million and a half dollars in today's dollars. And so it was a dollar a byte. And you know, try to get your head around that number next time you wander down to Fry's and you buy you know, terabytes or petabytes of all sorts of memory for almost pocket change. So, so there was, there was uh, I mean, uh, people today can't imagine that you could write those kinds of programs with those kinds of resources. I want to go back to this Huff Transform thing. That's yes, another, another please. Story. I was actually, you saw me shuffling through my papers. I know I had that written down somewhere in my questions, so, but I couldn't pick it up. So, so um, that turned out to be also very important because, again, of computational limitations and the need to be able to find lines and images. Remember this the shaky world. to find world. the edges of things? Well, once you found the edges, how do you fit straight lines? Okay. So finding the edges is kind of an image processing step where you do some sort of spatial differentiation or something of the sort to find discontinuities in the, in the um, intensities, uh -huh. the brightness. Mm -hmm. But now all you have is a bunch of points. And, and then you, how do you draw the line? You've got to have lines, because I mentioned um, we should ask the cameraman to point the camera at that baseboard, because that is exactly what it looked like in the shaky blocks world environment. Okay. And so, <clears throat> and so you need to fit lines so you know the room and you know the geometry and you know where you are. And so it's easy to spend a lot of computation trying all sorts of things. Well, somebody had, um, I guess I had read Azra Rosenfeld's book, and he had a paragraph on this thing called the Huff Transform, which was a patent invented by a guy named Paul Huff when he was at the Atomic Energy Commission and was looking at um, cloud chamber photographs, and you get these little dotted streaks, streaks yeah. and you want to fit straight lines. Oh, yeah, and so yeah, he yeah. had invented a, quite a clever method for transforming those points all the points in an image into a transform plane. And his transform plane, each point in the original image corresponded to a straight line in the transform plane. And you could trivially prove in one or two lines that intersecting straight lines in the transform plane corresponded to collinear points in the original image. Obviously, two points are collinear, so yeah, two lines intersect. Mm -hmm. They're not parallel. Um, and if they're three or four or five, then you have, have that. So it was very clever, but it had one fatal flaw computationally. And the fatal flaw was that because they were straight lines using a y equals mx plus b parameterization for straight lines, slopes could go to infinity, mm. which means that the transform plane was unbounded, which is really inconvenient in computers to have an unbounded array. <clears throat> Around that time, Nils Nilsson, who somehow just knows this stuff, suggested that I look into an obscure branch of 19th century mathematics called integral geometry, which, by the way, isn't about either integrals or geometry. So I'm looking through this obscure 19th century stuff, 
And I see that the geometers of the day had very good reasons for using a parameterization of a straight line, which I had never seen before. In high school, I learned y equals mx plus b, just like you did. Yeah. And instead, they used something called a rho theta, or normal parameterization, which parameterizes a, <coughs> a straight line by drawing another line from the origin of the coordinate system perpendicular to the straight line you have, and you look at that angle that that oh, line yeah, makes yeah, 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 and yeah. that distance to the perpendicular intercept. Right. And so there's a sine-cosine kind of thing yeah. that says, so that's perfectly good, except here's what's beautiful about it. What's beautiful about it is you can parameterize the lines in your space on a bounded transform space where one dimension is like zero to pi, zero to 180 degrees or something like that. And the other dimension is the extent of your image. How big is your, you don't have an infinite plane, you know, you've got a square mm. of an image. Mm. So that determines the length of the radius maximum and the angle, as I mentioned, goes, I think it was zero to 180 degrees, zero to pi. And so your transform space is now beautifully bounded in this tight square and doesn't yep. go to infinity in, yeah. the, in one direction. Right. And moreover, it's also with rotation and variance, so it doesn't matter how you choose your coordinate axis, you'll get the same thing. So I said, aha, we wrote a paper, Dick Dude and I wrote a paper, we added some clustering at the end because you don't have exact intersections because points aren't exactly collinear. And we just called, I forget, we called it generalized or modified or something, Huff transform. And if I knew how popular that would have been, I wouldn't have just continued to name it after Paul Huff. You know, I would have called it a heart transform. <laughs> but, you know, I covered myself with boyish modesty. And my wife says, if you were the sort of person who did that, you probably would have been intolerable to live with. <laughs> so it was a great trade-off. Well, how, so how did that Im immediately pay off in the Shaky project? We use that all the time in the image analysis stuff for the application, for multiple applications. One was to look at these geometric big boxes or blocks that we have. Remember, Shaky was in kind of a giant block world with big cubes and wedges and stuff. Right. And uh, so we analyzed the image. I mean, there's... Coming out of the camera. Yeah, that was the basic tool. You do differentiation and a Huff transform and, or a heart transform and, yeah. Hmm. And then, well, let's, let's trace that line forward. How does that um, that establishes its utility in shaky, well, and that, then how does it get out well, into so, the so wild? There, there, there's a whole literature on this now. Um, some people extended it again, building on that. But um, what I've been told, and again, I don't know how people know this stuff. Maybe they look at Google Scholar or something. So I don't vouch for any of this. I'm just repeating rumors. Mm -hmm. But I'm told that it's the most widely used um, basic um, image processing algorithm. Now, by the way, this is before you look at modern deep learning stuff that does no pre-processing, right? Modern deep learning stuff for all the fabulous results people are getting now in terms of image analysis. Yeah. You just put in whole images right. into a deep learning network, and, and, you know, a 10 or whatever deep um, neuron, uh, neural, you know, yeah. layered kind of thing. But <clears throat> at least until relatively recently when people were doing processing of the image itself to try to extract features and fit lines. That's what I've been told. Again, I don't know if that's true. At the very least, it was a very popular algorithm. And that was, was that, was that also kind of early in the project? Was yeah. another one of these? Yeah, yeah because it set Probably the kind of course. Early 70s, I would think, or late 60s. I don't remember the date. Mm 